um, the upcoming uh, changes in the uh, changes in some of the uh, some of the laws. Um, and uh, third, we have Chris uh, Chris McDonald. He's from CPM. He's going to be talking about upcoming technologies as well. Uh, and the fourth, we have Warren Vasquez. Uh, I don't have a topic for him, but he's going to present. Um, he's going to present as well. So let's get started. Frank, if you're ready, um, what I will do, I will mute everyone except for Frank, uh, and then if the bandwidth, just to save some bandwidth, let's uh, um, let's cut our videos as well. Okay. <clears throat> All right, thanks everybody for inviting us. We're happy to uh, do a small presentation today. Our time is limited to uh, around 25 minutes, so we'll go through each slide pretty quickly. And if there's any questions at the end, we will uh, definitely do our best to answer them. But nozzle technology is, is really interesting how far we've came and how far we're going in the future. But it's all not just about the nozzles. So we're going to talk about a little few things here today pretty quickly. We're going to talk about these six subjects. We'll just touch base on them. Uh, what I feel before we learn and how we operate trucks and how we get going uh, to do our jobs better, we have to understand some of our products that we have. And one of our one of our uh, main products other than the cleaning nozzle, the second most important thing other than the truck and the third, the nozzle, is the preparation of our hoses. So we wanna make sure that our hose is always in good shape before we go out. We always wanna make sure that everything is prim and proper. Uh, we don't wanna take any any type of chances. You'll see hoses here in these photos. Uh, we have everything from um, old hose that's coming apart because of the sun. We have banana peeled or stripped hoses. It's caught on the edge of uh, piping that's broke. And we have mis crimped nozzles, which are, are um, sorry, miscrimped fittings that are quite common in the industry. Something just to remember, guys, with these new trucks and these older trucks, the different pressure ratings on them, always make sure that your hose is color coded to the pressure of your truck. Just always remember it's simple. The uh, orange is 2,500, the blue is 3,000, and the green is 4,000 on your external tubes. It's very important because when you go to mend, and to repair and fix the hoses, each hose manufacturer has colors on the dies to match their internal tube coloring, not the external, the internal. So the outside cover is an organization that's a common code of practice for pressure ratings. The internal tube color dictates the manufacturer of the hose. So it's very important you match the dies to the fittings to the hose. So just some stuff to keep in mind. Some of the stuff that we use to prevent the damage of hoses and to help clean our pipes better are what we call hose protector systems. So we have everything from external manhole rollers, internal fin guides. We have multiple rollers that they put down into the manholes. Uh, they're usually used on a little bit bigger pipe. And one thing we always wanna make sure um, you have a leader hose and that's our sacrificial lamb that we don't damage that first 25 to 50 foot of the, the, the rotter hose. Bumblebees, tiger tails, hose protectors, quite common. They also help prevent a banana peeling of the hose. And we always wanna make sure, you know, we want those fin guides not only <clears throat> to keep the nozzle in the center of the pipe, but help to prevent it from turning around in the pipe and chasing you back. So there's just some of the, the quick tidbits on um, hose protection and hose identification. So. Getting into the nozzle mechanics, um, a nozzle is just not a nozzle anymore. There's more to it. We have all these big fancy trucks. We have all these little trailer jetters that folks are using. So we have a wide variety of products out there and we have a wide variety of nozzle manufacturers that produce for those truck and trailer manufacturers. So some of the nozzle mechanics get into uh, the thrusting, the GPMs and the PSIs. Now, why is that important? It's important for several things. We don't wanna have a nozzle that we build up too much thrust in, but we don't put enough water through to move the material out of the pipe. We wanna make sure that we have the right gallons per minute, GPMs, because we wanna convey the material back to the manhole the, from the debris that we wash off the inside of the pipe. If we have huge pressure and no flow, uh, we can't convey it back. Uh, pressure is developed by our pumps. There's many, many different pumps out in the industry. 
Uh, there's single piston pumps, there's triplex pumps, there's quadra pumps. So we have to be very familiar with what pump we have, and we have to be familiar with how it produces the water. And the restriction would be from the nozzle we put on it, and that's how you create your full system. So always keep in mind the router hose that we just talked about has a friction that goes through it. So there is a pressure loss per foot. So it's always important for us nozzle manufacturers to understand what pressures and flow the trunk produces or the trailer produces, but also how your operator operates the truck. If you have a, I guess my example is if you have a Corvette, you don't have to drive at 120 mile an hour to the grocery store. That's a 55 mile an hour speed limit. So that's what's best for that area. So meaning that if you have a 3000 PSI truck and you're in a fractured pipe, you're sure not going to use the 3000 PSI. You're going to you're going to back it down somewhat and uh, just barely uh, clean the pipe and get the material moved out so they can line it or repair it. So just some little tidbits there. One of the biggest things that are coming through that um, I guess you want to say that it's it's sewer talk now is NASCO has has come up with this tiered system and the tiered system uh, is very important. It's very important to understand because it could be read wrong. A lot of nozzle manufacturers use it as sales tools, but this this tiered system should just be used to explain to operators what you're getting for the price and what type of performance you're going to get to clean your pipes with. So a tier one nozzle. There's a lot of use for them out there. They're just a, they're just a simply drilled. Uh, they're a, they're a, a very common angle. So the jet angle is very common and there's no machining work done inside of it. It's just a big void area and you can see by the arrows how crazy they're getting. The water goes all over and then the, the it's it's a Newton's law. So the pressure and the flow comes back, pushes it through the orifices and it straightens out through the orifices and that's where you get your jet stream. Now you'll see in a few more slides down the road here that you'll see some distorted jet streams and how it affects the water cores of the nozzle and how it separates it as it leaves the nozzle body. The whole goal is to try to get a decent core stream to scour the wall and get the material off the wall of the pipes. So this here, tier one, is, is basically um, one of the less expensive nozzles you can have but there, there's areas for that to use it. A tier two nozzle, you can see somewhat, it has like a cone effect in the bottom of it. So the water goes in, it hits the, the rounded part of the cone. It, it doesn't act as sporadic or crazy inside the body and it starts to push back at a straighter stream. They also use longer flow straighteners in these. These type of nozzles are quite a bit more money and the reason they are quite a bit more money is because they have some engineering power behind them. And when they do that, they're structured internally on how to flow the water back through the orifices in a less friction manner. So these nozzles also can be adjusted through uh, orifices. You can put different orifices in them. You could replace the worn out orifices. And these are really, really good nozzles. They're true to the source and you, they'll never let you down with this type of design here. But again, they cost about double from what the tier one cost. <clears throat> we move on to the tier three nozzle. This is the premium nozzle in the industry today. Uh, I'm sure we'll see other stuff coming out as we as we go on years down the road. But a tier three right now is the premium nozzle. And the reason they call it a tier three premium nozzle is because of the each water passage has its own jet. So they're using the whole passage on the internal side of the nozzle as a flow straightener. So each each water that comes through the hose is produced by the pump. The water that comes through, it hits the channel, it separates to the channel, it's directed through the body and comes out the orifice. So basically it has a double flow straightener in it and compresses the water and turns it. This type of nozzle here will get the best stream and it'll keep the core together the longest. But keep in mind, it's four times more expensive than the other nozzles. Now, if you were doing general cleaning and you had to get a numerous amount of pipe done every, every day, and this might be something to look at. Uh, these are uh, really good for production and you can also adjust the orifices in them. 
and you can go smaller or larger uh, to, to tweak them to your truck or adjust them, adjust the water flow and pressure to your truck to get maximum use out of it. So this is some of the stuff we talked about, about the nozzle inserts. There's many different kinds in the industry. There's tungsten carbide, which is pretty common. There's ceramic inserts that are really common, and there's stainless steel that are common. And each one of them have a price range to go in. So it's kind of like a good, better, best. Manufacturers use them. They, there's a lot of work put in orifices. You can see the one to the far right. You can see the flow straighteners in it, that thing that looks like a number eight. It's very important out of these three type of nozzles that you keep them clean. And the way that you, the way that we recommend at Stone Age to keep them clean is actually remove the nozzle from the body and take it to a table and blow it out with an air gun or use a plastic or wooden toothpick. If you use any type of metal on a carbide or any type of metal on a ceramic, such as torch cleaning kits or little bitty micro files, even if you use it on stainless steel, it distorts the external tube of the insert. And pretty soon what you get is what you see there in the upper right hand corner where it says drilled straight and drilled chamfer. That's what that'll what it'll it'll etch out the inside of the nozzle like that in a matter of time. Then your core of your stream is completely gone. And it, when your core of your stream is completely gone, it's like your garden hose out in your your yard. Just put your thumb over it. The water goes everywhere and you don't want that sewer cleaning. You want that jet to hit the pipe real nice. So there's many different things engineers do. And that example two up in the right hand side is we've we've drilled some chamfers in the bottom of that body. And you can see how the chamber has wore much better than the one that we did a straight drill through, how it etched it out at the end when the water uh, uh, leaves the nozzle body. So it's just some experiment stuff that we did. But the whole goal is to keep the jet stream as straight as you can, as long as you can. So it hits the debris in the pipe as hard as it can to wash it away. You can see in the bottom picture how the core is broken apart. You'll see two or three highlighted white areas there. And you'll see that that's just uh, something in that that nozzle. It could be a piece of rubber, which is very common. Uh, sometimes we get sand stuck or lodged up in there. But I always recommend having your operators always uh, inspect those jets. Um, you know, visually hold them up to the light, put a flashlight in the end of the nozzle. You can see through the orifices real easy. And if it, if if worst case scenario, just take a second, take them out. But anytime you take inserts out of a nozzle, do it one at a time because manufacturers will stair step or change the flows and pressures in orifices to get it to match your truck. So if one orifice is an 05 thousandths and the other orifice is an 010 thousandths, you don't want to switch them. So just keep that in mind. Uh, any of this type of detail that you want to go into further, I'm available. Um, I'm more than happy to talk about this type of stuff. So some of the big important things is when you're out doing uh, flushing and jetting, you want to understand the jet angles. And this is where a lot of the technology of the nozzle comes in, is how, how the, the nozzle thrusts and how it operates as we go through uh, the pipe. So you have to understand your conditions if you're just flushing the bottom of the pipe and the only thing you're worried about is cleaning the bottom of the pipe and, and thrusting down and pulling back, then you want something to a 10 degrees. Uh, 10 degrees is going to be the perfect setup for you. And you'll see here in our little chart off to the right, anything at the low degrees, they pull really, really nice. They pull a thousand foot off with no problem at all. And you'll flush anything in that pipe back as long as it's on the bottom. However, you won't get the crown of the pipe. The crown of the pipe, will, you won't even touch it. Next off is the middle range. So you're from 15 to 30 degrees in the sewer world. So the 15 from 30 degrees, you're going to hit the pipe a little bit harder because your water jet is angled up to hit the pipe. But keep in mind, every time you raise the angle in a nozzle, you slow your process down. And sometimes it's better to do that because a slower operation will clean the pipe much better. Then for that real hard stuff that's really, really heavy and built onto the pipe, you have to hit it somewhat harder. And these angles are real nice, these 35 to 90s, because what it'll do, it'll get up underneath of your buildup and it'll go, uh, the water jet will go in between the buildup and the pipe and it'll wash it off in sheets. So it works out really well. 
So same way with penetrating. There's there's penetrating jets. They like, you know, they'll commonly use these. Uh, I was going to be funny and say ice, but you guys in Arizona don't have to worry too much about ice, I don't think, and especially in the south. But uh, they have many multiple degrees for these type angles out front. And then you'll see the rotation uh, nozzles that we support. Uh, they also uh, 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 os oscillate at a 15 degree uh, angle, which is really nice. So these fixed jets are straight out. You'll have two to four on each side and the uh, rotating nozzles actually move with the head. So then you have your light buildups and it's the same thing. But remember, anytime you penetrate out the front, your rear orifices are going to be fixed no more than 20 because you need that thrust to pull that uh, nozzle through the line. Um, if you did a neutral buoyancy on that, like a, a 60-40, it wouldn't pull or very well. You want anything over 60-40. So you need 60% out the back and 40% out the front. So this gives you an idea here on the, the jet pass and, and how the angles go. Um, I showed this picture here because um, in nozzle technology, it's also an important part of how you put your fin pipes behind you or your proofers. You wanna make sure that your jets do not hit the proofer. Uh, you can see here a 15 degree, the crown of the pipe would be where your yellow line's at. And you can see how the water stream is distorted because it's hitting the uh, the centralizer behind it. You can see the path on how it how it etches the the uh, the bottom there. So if you put your imagination cap on, that would be the bottom of the pipe. You can see that the stream is distorted there also. So then you get into a 35 degree and it's somewhat better. Uh, it's not doing too bad. That's uh, acceptable. It's not hitting any parts of the centralizer, so it's pretty good. And then you put that same crown of the pipe up on top there. You can see you're getting a full stream to wash the pipe out. Same way as on the bottom. <clears throat> now keep in mind, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going from 15 to 45. So the 15 is going to thrust down really, really nice. It's going to pull real hard. And when you get up into the 45 degree, it's going to pull a lot slower, but your pipe's going to be much cleaner because of the way that the angle is hitting, the water is hitting the pipe. So it's also very important on how you put the nozzle in the pipe. And I know this is hard for a lot of us because the openings in pipes are so hard that we don't want to put centralizers behind the nozzles. Anytime you can take a central or I'm sorry, anytime you can take a nozzle and take an extra minute and put a fin guide or a centralizer on it, it's going to improve your cleaning way over 50 percent because of the way that your water comes out of the back of the nozzle and it equally hits the top and the bottom which gives you a, a good cleaning path. And this is some examples here of how your standoff distance works versus your flow. And you can just, these are just visuals. You can see that the top jet is over 20 inches away before it hits the pipe and the bottom is, is under two. And <clears throat> with controlled rotation, when you get a controlled rotation nozzle and you skid it on the bottom like this, it's, it's hard on the nozzles and it's hard on everything because the jet incident agitates so much water that it actually wears out the leader hoses. And that's why another reason why you want to use a nice rubber leader hose uh, to help uh, prevent the wear of that uh, rotter hose. It's pretty expensive. So here, this gives you an example here of getting the, the nozzle back up in the center of the pipe. Uh, you have over five and a half inches on each on each jet hitting and it, it actually, this, um, this will improve your cleaning over 50%, just simple stuff like this. So with that, speed is very important. So what, what we did, I, had our, I asked our engineering staff just to put some of these graphs together. These are different angles on how uh, the nozzles go through the pipe. And you'll see that angles, jet angles, are just like um, hose binding that we learned about earlier on the hoses. Each one of those hoses we talked about earlier, even though they're different manufacturers, the way that they braid their, braid their hoses is they have different angles on them. So we do the same thing with the jets. We have different angles than most of our competitors because we feel we want to get underneath the debris and wash it off the pipe, you know, and, and lead the industry in that. 
So this will show you here on how the speed actually affects the covering of the pipe when you clean. So when you see the uh, the larger gaps in the pipe or in the, the black lines here, uh, they're going pretty fast. So you, you want something between these two here to get your pipe as clean as you can. Let me just show this. I think this will work. Yeah, there we go. So we have fixed nozzles. We have a lot of general cleaning stuff. It's just a standard fixed nozzle. We have general cleaning dual position nozzles. So there's two degrees coming out the back. It's thrusting in a cleaning jet. We talked about the the uh, sent the the ones for blockages, the chisels and everything with the different types of uh, front ends on them to break through blockages. We got some pretty uh, pretty heavy root removal nozzles, the uh, destroyers. These are for monster root masses that you can't get through. Uh, we've had some really good luck with our new uh, root destroyer that's out there. Um, we've we've been able to take out a lot of lot of roots with our root destroyer. And then you have the uh, tap cutters for laterals and different type of stuff that's been put through the pipes. Uh, and then you have the percussion cutters. These work like hammer drills. Um, these things and pipes are just unbelievably awesome. The only disadvantage in this, if they get a little bit turned in a pipe or something goes disarray, you drill through the pipe faster than you can stop the truck. For big pipes, you want to do the storm drain cleaning. Uh, you want to keep that uh, water flow focused on the bottom of the pipe. These guys here will do that. Uh, the spinning nozzles, these are for polishing and uh, the polishing the pipes after they've been cleaned, these are nice for that. And the reason these I call them polishing pipes is because they spin so fast they break the streams. So the manufacturer learned that. So what they did, they started cross drilling the streams up here and it slowed the nozzle bodies down. But to get into a true controlled rotation nozzle, these manufacturers here and we're from Warthog. So uh, I know best about the Warthog, so I can talk about that quite a bit. The, the Warthog nozzle uh, was the first nozzle to market in the early 90s, late 80s, and we've gotten several competitors since then. But some of our focus is on speed control and the way that we do that with a viscous fluid, and we feel that that's the way the market should go because of longevity and ease of maintenance and simplicity. We also have a classic line here that got us to where we're at today. This is the most common workhorse of the industry tool. We have everything from quarter inch all the way to inch and a quarter. But our Magnum line is the line that really shines because we're able to um, add specialty equipment to it, like root to cut, root cutters, uh, control cleans, which are ant they they eliminate the toilet blowing and they eliminate the vortex and pipes that, and help prevent toilet blowing. And then we have our we have our flagship called our switcher, and this is my favorite nozzle uh, for several, several reasons. But the biggest reason this is my favorite nozzle is because you have two nozzles in one, meaning you can do two things with it. It's jetted. It has two different ways you can jet it or you can jet it all the same. So just real quick, the switcher nozzle is two nozzles in one. So that means you can run the back jets for thrusting. And you can clean pipe all day with that. If you want to turn your truck off, it switches a mechanism in the head. And when it switches the mechanism in the head, it goes to a cleaning mode. And then you can pull that and the debris back to you. And you can jet either path on how you want. So most commonly in, in areas where they're restricted on water, we're, we're jetting the two paths or the two nozzle heads at 20 to 30 gallons different. And what that means, we're going out at, at uh, 40, 50 gallons, and we're coming back at 80 gallons. And we're getting just great reviews on how it's cleaning the pipe. And this, this works, we'll give a little example of it.
So that's our that's our switcher mode model. And this is our uh, this is just our standard Magnum series and something that we do a lot different than the competitors. We have less working parts, which is a big benefit for everybody. Uh, anytime you can have less working parts in any type of tooling, your cost of operation is much cheaper. So we focus on bigger jets with larger water uh, capacity going through each jet, which gives us more horsepower, gives us more force, and gives actually gives us more flow through the pipe. Um, it's a it's actually an, uh, a heavier heavier impact, which it does make quite a bit of a difference on this. And the slow speed. And then uh, I know that we went really, really fast through this presentation, so I hope nobody was sleeping. I hope we got something out of it. So I always put a couple little pictures in here at the end. So this is uh, this is our cat we trained in college. He is now a certified plumber. And then uh, this is this is some of our buddies we graduated with that had some problems. And I want to thank everybody. We used uh, a lot of different manufacturers' photos in here. And so I just wanted to take a second and thank them all. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you, Frank. Uh, do we have any questions for Frank? I have a question. Go ahead, sir. All right, Frank, this is Vern. So hey, Vern. Uh, are there any special uh, uh, recommendations uh, or uh, for the different types of pipe that we're cleaning, say I got BCP and in uh, certain sections, I might have PVC or CIPP lined. Uh, is there any special considerations that that need to be taken uh, when we're selecting those nozzles? Yes, I, I'm very glad you brought that up. Vern. We're learning every day uh, on different materials with different piping on how it scorches the inside of the pipes. So we're on a fixed nozzle versus a controlled rotation nozzle. Uh, you have to keep them moving, um, whether it's a fixed or a, um, a controlled. A controlled is more forgiving, meaning a spinning nozzle is more forgiving in a PVC pipe because the we're learning the internal parts of the PVC piping and the plastic piping, anything to do with that type of material. After, uh, after it's been in the ground a while, we're learning that it scars pretty easily. So you'll see pretty soon, I think you're going to see in the industry, you're going to see more people using wheeled centralizers and stuff like that to help uh, uh, add to the life of the pipe. Because we all know as soon as we fracture a pipe or skin it or do anything to it, more material gets caught on it, especially with this crazy phase we're going through now with uh, baby wipes. Um, we're getting hit hard in the New York area with uh, the low flush toilets and then the they call it the flushable cat litter that has clay in it. So we we have a horrible combination coming with with baby wipes, everybody using them, uh, flushable cat litter that no no cat litter is flushable, and so we want to prevent as many much scarring in the, as in the pipes as we can. Whether uh, another thing, another trick is I don't know in your area, Vern, ductile iron piping. Yes, we uh, do. We okay. Got, we got duct and we all know that it's got the coating on it. So you have to be very careful because these centralizers um, are scar and the duct tower, the coating so bad that it's it's becoming an issue. So we're, we're, we provide um, polypropylene skids for them. And then we provide fan jets because if you use a round core jet, it actually hits too hard. So we have to basically, I don't like saying this, but we have to detune our performance to clean those pipes. So yeah, be aware of that. And there's there's some stuff too. There's some stuff in the National Pipe Association that gives some better pressure ratings than what I just did for, uh, for that type of application. I right, appreciate that, thank you. Yeah, thank but you if you... If you guys get tied up, just send me an email and I'll work with our engineering staff to get the fact facts. 
um, Frank uh, Bosker here. Uh, we are there any nozzles for bigger pipes? I saw your nozzle was going up to 40 inch. We have a 42 inch sewer that uh, a client of mine over here is having a lot of trouble uh, with the sedimentation and stuff. So are there any products that you have or are there anything in the makes? Very quick. Well, we can we always can design stuff but depending on the where the material is at the application it sounds like if there's nothing on the crown and nothing on the side of the pipes you want to concentrate with a floor cleaner okay it's more of a floor cleaning exercise uh frank so yeah yeah i'll i'll probably if you if there's something else special design i'll i'll shoot out an email but that uh, yeah. if there is any product let us know okay um, with that, I know, uh, well, Dennis has a question. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah. Hi, Frank. Great presentation. I was, I'm wondering, do, does Warthog make anything for, uh, duct work for cleaning duct work that gets really loaded with stuff, fiberglass, for example? So help, help me out here. I don't, I want to make sure I'm on the right path. So you want to do it with air? Well, um, you know, it could be, it could be pressurized. Well, I'm probably not, you know, in the 3000, 4000 range, but I, I think um, I've heard of a Polish company that uses ice to clean duct work, but, uh, or like dry ice. Um, but I, I would expect that there's a market out there. There's so much duct work that's totally filthy. That, uh, oh, I would agree. Well, yeah. it's time for, it. time for me to take a note. <laughs> I could be on to something. Okay. Yeah, I think Dennis, you're referring to ice pigging. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, well, let's move on. Um, moving on. Thank you, Frank. Let's move on. The next uh, presentation we got Dennis, but before we move on to our next presentation, um, Easy Water would like to thank our sponsors. Uh, VNV Enterprises, LLC, Brown and Caldwell, Westland Resources, CPM, and AWI. Thank you, thank you for your support. Uh, please uh, continue supporting us, and we'll do more webinars like this. Uh, go ahead, uh, Dennis. Uh, if uh, do you, does anyone, everyone, able to see my screen? I, I can control the presentation for you, Dennis. Oh, um, I, oh, I, you I can, thought you I would can do share it, if it I too. Could. Yeah, no, I can, uh, I can, uh, I can de-share it and you can, you can start yours. Go okay. ahead, Dennis. We'll see. Well, I don't know. Can you do it? I, I don't see yours. Uh, Bhaskar? Yes, sir. Yeah, you can, um, okay. you can present I, it. Yeah. Well, I, I, are you seeing it? I, I'm not, I, let's see. We, we can see your presentation, Dennis. Oh, you can? Okay. Now I just have to get to okay now i see except i don't see me let's see where do you see um you make that uh make that screen bigger of yours on the teams okay. this one I oh, don't know which one like this yeah. uh I'm, I'm show participants now. I'm not sure how I do that. Sorry. Yeah, I no, want... we're able to see your screen. If you're not able to, you're not able to see your screen, you're saying? No, I, I cannot see my screen. Okay. Um, uh, let me share mine then. Maybe that would work. Can you, can you see my screen? I can see the uh, right. You can see the thank you. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. You may. You want me to do this? I that that that'll probably be better. And then I'll yeah. I'll you just say next slide and I'll I'll hit next slide. Okay. Thanks. All right. Good. So uh, I I just wanted to say to everybody who who's on, thanks for uh, joining it, um, the collection systems webinar, and um, I won't go up on Frank. Uh, lead Frank's lead about um, really showing kind of an evolution of of uh, tools in in the sewer and um, 
what, what I have is a also a, a discussion about a critical tool for maintaining collection systems. And uh, it's just gone through a rather radical technical evolution. Anyway, my name is Dennis Froelich. I'm a, um, a chemical engineer who has been working in the industry for quite a while, and I'm with Froelich Environmental. Next slide. Um, I wanted to give a, a Oscar next. Uh, I wanted to give a quick little uh, overview of my background. Um, 1982, graduated in chemical engineering. My first job was during the uh, horrible economic slump in 1982. Um, uh, Oscar, uh, I just want to say real quick, my first job was in odor control. And it was as an engineering intern back in 83. And uh, it was basically at a treatment plant doing an odor control study at the beach, not too bad. But uh, more recently, um, I've been involved with WEF quite a bit um, after a, a 20 year career with Pima County Wastewater uh, Management doing their odor control program. Um, anyway, with WEF, I've been involved in the odor committee for the last uh, nine years and um, more recently involved in the subcommittee on the manual of practice. Next slide. Um, so with the manuals of manuals of practice, there are quite a few numbered manuals of practice. The one that I'm going to talk about today um, is the one for odor and emissions control. And basically the manuals of practice, if you're not familiar with them, are the collective knowledge of all of the membership and the people in those committees getting together, professionals, um, operators, everybody who was in, interested and wants to contribute to put together uh, uh, their knowledge with the team that is uh, that's put together by the sort of uh, leaders of the committee to um, produce a technical manual that is of a very practical nature. Anyway, the first one for odor and emissions was issued in 2004, and it was um, really limited to odor and emissions control from wastewater treatment plants. Uh, next slide. Um, so this year, this last year, actually, um, the WEF manual practice number 25 uh, was issued and of interest to our, our collections webinar is that it, for the first time, includes odor and emissions control for collection systems. Um, that's about half of the uh, manual is uh, dedicated to that. Um, and then the other half is for water resource recovery facilities. They changed the name from wastewater treatment facilities. Okay, next slide. So basically, um, I'm going to focus on only the collection systems aspect of it, but I thought it was important to let you know that uh, the manual practice in 2020 table of contents um, covers, uh, basically shows you that it covers not only odors and odorous compounds, but how to measure uh, um, measurement of odors, um, regulations and policies, um, source sampling for all the different types of sources. Um, so, uh, chapter five is on collection systems. That's what I'll be focusing on. But uh, there are other chapters on water resource recovery facilities, solids handling, and then some of the technologies that are used for odor control, like biological odor control, including biotrickling filters and biofilters. Um, and then also there's a chapter on physical and thermal odor control, which is physical is physical adsorption um, and thermal. Uh, the thermal part is thermal oxidation. Um, and then there's a, uh, another chapter um, on uh, odor, odor impact assessment. Um, that is basically how, how consulting firms or municipalities can do their basically some guidance on how to do your own uh, odor impact assessment. Um, which necessarily involves the public. And so uh, the public, uh, the last chapter is on public outreach and involvement. 
and that really has a some um, how to um, sections on putting together complaint management and sort of records management to have a more effective um, public response um, response for the public in, in terms of voter issues. Next slide, please, Oscar. Okay, so now um, I'm moving to the collections uh, chapter, chapter five, and I'm talking about, I'm basically gonna go through, it's, it's pretty extensive. I'm just gonna go through what is included in here and make some comments on some of the highlighted um, parts of the table of contents. Um, I've highlighted these because I, I can make some comments on them. Um, so the introduction is basically sort of a um, generic uh, introduction, but uh, the, the second chapter uh, talks about characterization of odors and odor issues in, in conveyance systems. Um, the first part is on liquid sampling. Best part about the liquid sampling um, section is that they have a nice table that includes um, all of the all of the parameters that you probably want to do uh, your your including your field measurement program and so basically just a quick review of these liquid sampling um, um, parts is that uh, is it we always will measure the temperature, the conductivity, P and pH of our, our liquids. Um, sometimes we measure the alkalinity of, of the samples. It's really uh, important to get a, a sense of how oxic the sample is, the wastewater sample. So you would like to measure uh, oxidation reduction potential as ORP or the dissolved oxygen. Um, oftentimes the dissolved oxygen is so low in concentration that the oxidation reduction potential uh, makes more sense. Also, uh, you will want to measure your liquid sulfide concentrations, um, uh, total and dissolved. And, um, and moving on to the other aspect that you would like to measure, not so much um, a liquid, but uh, to complement your liquid sample is the gas phase hydrogen sulfide. Um, and the other thing that I like about what they've included also is to a, a manhole sampling that you would measure the uh, differential pressure between the sewer headspace and ambient air. And that's used to really tell you whether or not you're going to have emissions or whether or not the sewer is going to be so to speak, inhaling and pulling air in. So these are just sort of basic things that are, uh, it's great that they go into some discussion about. Um, so there's, I said a little bit about air monitoring. They really do sort of point out the two uh, uh, H2S monitoring logging devices that are available, that's great. And then there's some more on more advanced methods um, in terms of instrumentation, there's a nice little uh, section on actually how to install um, real-time instrumentation, like a multi-parameter sonde, which is a basically a, a logging device that you put in situ into the wastewater that measures all of those parameters that I discussed, with maybe the exception of alkalinity. Um, uh, but can get most of them. And there are there are electrochemical sons, and then there are now um, uh, UV vis uh, spec, uh, spectrometers that can be lowered in. Those um, typically are for more fixed applications, but um, those are also discussed in terms of advanced testing and monitoring and um, are, are of great use. Uh, Something that wasn't actually, I didn't see it being mentioned was the fact that there are also optical methods now for doing dissolved sulfide. Um, you do have to have pH uh, measurement done at the same time. Next slide. So um, 
I'm not going to talk about this one too much, but um, there's a really, really complete and um, I think quite good read in the chapter or section three of chapter five, which is uh, about collection system evaluation and design. So they really address how important flow monitoring is and, and, and to complement that flow modeling to understand um, really the hydraulic regime, which has impacts on, um, on odor emissions through how much turbulence and how much headspace there will be. These are all important considerations, and that's covered in the, the next part. Um, they go over force main design, which, uh, are, you know, historically was neglected in terms of uh, odor generation uh, potential. I'd say in the last maybe five, 10 years, you, you would always have odor control associated with uh, the outfall from a force main. The discharge manhole from uh, Moving on, uh, they talk about odor capture and containment. It is of interest that in that that's where that differential pressure measurement comes in. Really talks about um, how how you would design a vapor extraction system to um, to contain the odors part. And there's a lot on linings and coatings, which is important. Um, I wish that they had discussed a little bit about um, the impact on sulfide generation, because when you had concrete pipes, they, they actually uh, inhibited some of the uh, sulfide generation. Um, moving on, uh, site selection, and then pump station construction, and with the equipment you might need, uh, and Something that is often overlooked again, maintenance and access requirements. I can't tell you how, how many uh, manholes had low diversion structures that somebody had to go in and change the boards. And, uh, you know, uh, really, it's a risky business. If... Next slide. Uh, thank you. Um, so then uh, section four of manual practices, this is very new stuff and it's very interesting because they've made great strides in the last five years on discussing the movement of air because everybody needs to recognize, especially if you're concerned with odor, that our sewers convey two streams. One is the wastewater stream and the other is the movement of air. Here, Dennis, uh, Dennis, yeah. sorry, uh, Bhaskar here. I, I think we're, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing. I just, can you, is there a way you can turn off your video and, and do the presentation? Maybe that would solve some of the issues. Turn off my. Just turn off your camera. Okay. Okay. Does that make a difference? Yes. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Wow. Odd. Okay. So. The um, anyway, the assessment of um, of air movement is important because, uh, as I was saying, there are two streams flowing in our sewers. That's the wastewater and the air movement. If your pipe is half full, um, you might have about um, half half of the wastewater volume flowing. Um, that's how the volume of air flowing. So let's say you've got a, you're conveying 10 million gallons a day of wastewater, you may be conveying uh, 5 million gallons of vapor, a headspace vapor that is uh, odorous. So uh, quantifying that flow, understanding the uh, pressure involved um, is vital to understanding how to manage that headspace odor and how to design for uh, capturing it and treating it. Um, so uh, at this point, they've uh, there's some discussion about the airflow modeling that has been done. It's it's evolved quite quite a bit to the point now where um, with pressure measurements at manholes and some understanding of the wastewater flows, you can model 
what the uh, air flows are today and calibrate that model. It takes a, a there's some parameters that can be calibrated, and then your airflow will be with future flows, et cetera, to make sure that your design for a vapor extraction system might, in fact, uh, be uh, future proof. Okay. Um, then there's also some discussion about um, computational fluid dynamics modeling, and that, that can be important for um, diversion structures where, let's say, you want to scalp flow to a, a, a wastewater treatment plant that's upstream of, say, a regional facility, and you want to understand how much uh, flow gets diverted over. Well, this, this also helps you with understanding um, the head space in that and, and basically solid settling, et cetera. So um, those are some of the aspects covered in, um, in section four of chapter five. M moving on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, the, the next section is on source control and, um, and it basically covers some of the uh, constituents that uh, are impacting odor emissions. There's a really good section um, covering screening methods for uh, both um, if you're concerned about um, low uh, explosive constituents or constituents that might um, uh, have a uh, explosion potential. This is a meth, they provide some methods for uh, considering that. There's also methods for considering um, uh, once you have some measurements of your, of your constituents in the wastewater, assessing whether or not they pose a risk to, um, uh, you know, long-term uh, exposure, um, also to acute exposure. So it's ways of screening the constituents in for understanding if they pose a risk to um, uh, an event like an explosion or to uh, workers who may be exposed to them. And it's um, it's the first time it was really well done. Um, there's some on permits and ordinances that, that's more for industrial wastewater control. And there is a section on how that kind of um, uh, section might be run and how to how you would proceed with that work. Um, uh, and then there's something on a section on pretreatment of, of industrial waste. The constituents impacting odor emissions and the pretreatment of industrial waste, um, I think these are really, really important considerations for any municipal wastewater uh, odor control program because really um, grease traps from restaurants and some some uh, high pH or low pH uh, high um, alkalinity um, uh, waste uh, can be de determining of your odor program uh, success. So one thing that they talk about in here are grease interceptors and things that can be done to uh, help control odor emissions and sulfide generation from uh, grease interceptors. Uh, there is a some discussion also of like a canning um, factory that that had very high high um, VOD. It was high strength wastewater, but also very um, acidic because they were trying to do pH control and they had difficulty doing that. Anyway, it's it's a very good section. Um, let's move on to uh, uh, section six. Next slide, please. Okay, so this one, I'm, I'm not going to talk about too much, but I do want to highlight that they, uh, there's a good section on safety. Um, and then there's basically a, a lot on reviewing the benefits of CCTV for doing inspections but also some of the new methods that include radar, ultrasonic, and laser scan in inspection techniques. They do talk about a little bit about some of the um, robotics that can be 
sent into the sewers as well that can do multi-parameter um, assessment of sewer um, status in terms of condition assessment. A little bit on smoke testing, which um, is of, I would say, you know, it's pretty retro and um, has to be done right if you don't want to uh, cause a problem with, um, you know, fire alarms, et cetera. Uh, anyway, also just a, a, a lot on um, uh, keeping in terms of maintenance of the sewer to uh, minimize odor generation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, let's see, how am I doing on time, Bhaskar? Or we were at 10 o'clock, so yeah. Okay, no. I'm almost done, so we're good. Um, so um, section six is on uh, O&M practices, and there's some good stuff on codings and record keeping. Um, and the record keeping is important for, uh, obviously, for making sure that you're addressing um, uh, maintenance and uh, being able to assist with odor complaints and and therefore finding uh, cause and effect. Moving on to section seven. Okay, and I'll just, uh, I'll probably end with this slide. The next slide would be on various treatment and there's quite a bit there, but let's speak to the uh, chemical um, oxidants. Um, uh, there's in chemical oxidants, they're basically covering sodium hypochlorite, uh, um, um, hydrogen peroxide and potassium permanganate. And really um, uh, the hydrogen peroxide is probably the most utilized, but all of these um, oxidizing agents are strong, short-lived, very, um, very hazardous. Um, and so uh, are probably not recommended, but they're out there and they're still being used. Um, Pima County's recently weaned completely, completely off of um, hydrogen. I mean, sodium hypochlorite. Uh, uh, it has it has some benefits though, um, in terms of high pH and uh, and oxidizing potential. But the issue with all of these oxidizing agents is simply that that um, they are short lived. So you you have a long sewer, you got to uh, feed at several locations. Biological treatment methods, it's kind of a, a misnomer for this section. It's really about using nitrate salts, which are a very safe way of, um, in terms of handling, very safe way of introducing oxygen into the sewer uh, to both inhibit sulfide generation and to treat sulfides. Uh, so that's a really good section. I'm not going to talk about iron salts and peroxide regenerated iron because, um, you know, uh, you can go there at your own peril. Um, oxygenation is uh, probably uh, largely the future for a lot of odor control, especially at inverted siphons, et cetera. And um, one of the uh, wi more widely recognized uh, based on a benchmarking study we did a couple years ago is pH adjustment is probably the most successful and steady way of um, controlling odor by um, odor generation and odor emissions by adjusting the pH so that all of the sulfides stay in solution instead of um, being emitted into the headspace and causing corrosion. Um, one aspect that they do talk about but that is also very new is the combination of um, alkaline agent or they they talk about caustic in terms of slug dosing, but that's really not recommended by me. Um, the addition of nitrate salts with uh, magnesium hydroxide is uh, something that they've talked about uh, for the first time. So, uh, Bhaskar, why don't you just move to the next slide and we'll just get rid of it real quick. Uh, Next slide after that. Okay, and I've already talked about. So, uh, next slide. Okay, so vapor phase treatment. They have really good sections on basically uh, biofilters, biotrickling filters, 
of which biofilters are probably the most widely applied for collection systems. Some places that do that, I, you know, I, I haven't seen one. Um, adsorption is basically granular activated carbon systems at um, um, in, in the conveyance systems. And those, of course, have been used for a long time, but they are require monitoring and uh, change out and maintenance. Um, so uh, have a lot of O and M. Moving on, I think we're probably done there. How about the last slide, Bhaskar? Yep. So um, I don't know if we have time for questions or if there are any. I apologize for the uh, whirlwind tour, but uh, I wanted to really show you guys that there is this really great book that can be used for all the municipalities to both inform themselves and show them how to do, take care of some of these things themselves. But um, this is the really the collective knowledge of the last 20 years plus of all of the professionals and, and, uh, and operators and managers of municipalities across the country. So it is a treasure trove and I, I hope you um, delve into it. That's all I got. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we can take uh, maybe a couple of questions. Uh, anyone has a question for Dennis? Once, twice. I have a question for you, Dennis. One thing is on the force main design. Have you seen, um, I know the order, order control and during lift stations and stuff, you know, the, there's the order control usually at the, um, at the pump station, and then sometimes, depending on uh, cities, there's order control on the discharge side. Uh, but most of the order orders, there is another there is another component that's always ignored is the air release valves. Um, and most of right. the operators don't like air release valves because that's the weakest point in the force main. They usually shut them off either because they don't want to maintain it, or they don't operate, or they cause orders. So. Um, Oscar, to, you're absolutely right. So, what yeah, is are, there uh, any topic that talks about air release valves in for on force mains that can or, or some kind um, of a, you know? I I, uh, I I'm embarrassed to say that I am not sure if that is covered in there. It should be. I, I imagine it is. Um, I can look real quick for you. Um, uh, uh, I will find it right here. It's uh, page ninety four. I think it's really brief, but I will tell you that you're absolutely right. Um, in Pima County, we I had two situations where, in fact, that was the case, and um, and some of the problems were alleviated greatly by uh, changing out the uh, air relief valves. And uh, there are, in fact, now odor control systems for air relief valves. I believe Walker is one of the vendors that makes stuff. But uh, let me answer your question here in terms of uh, force mains and uh, wastewater flows. So, uh, nope, there's nothing on it there. Um, let me look under the force main part. Design considerations. Um, they do talk about air relief valves. Discharge should be designed with minimum odor impact, bending the gas through a tall stack. Well above grade helps disperse the odors in sensitive areas. Odor control device should be installed. So they talk about it, but they don't talk about it in terms of failure due to corrosion and stuff, which is actually a uh, long-term problem. So that is a yeah. great, great question you asked. Um, um, and I, and I, if if I might, I would say that one of the most, the biggest changes from the 2004 manual of practice to this one is the recognition of the dynamic nature of our sewer systems and odor problems. And that really, uh, that's why it is always more complex than we think, and that the average situation is not usually the one that causes the odor problem. But uh, that's, that's all I got to say on that. And thank you very much for anybody who listened. <laughs> thank you, Dennis. No, that was very informative. Uh, uh, 
All right, let's move on to our next presenter, um, Chris. Chris from Construction Product Marketing. I'm Oscar. Hey, Chris, you wanted to go ahead and share your screen? Yeah, give me just a second. Or your presentation over you. Perfect. All right. Go ahead, Chris. All right, thanks, Bosker. Appreciate getting the opportunity to get on here and talk with everybody today. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I'm sitting in my truck in a parking lot in California. So I think I got a good connection and good signal. So if I start having any uh, communication issues, Bosker, just interrupt me and let me know, please. Will do. So far, so good. All right, great. So, and, and you know, it's, it was, uh, I. That manual of practice that Dennis is talking about, that's a, a great document. And like Bosker had mentioned on the ARV side of it, you know, a lot of a lot of the same things that are covered in that manual practice apply to those ARVs, you know, like, you know, what the access is like, what the safety conditions are like, trying to, to access them, um, ease of maintenance, odor control issues, maintenance cycles, and like was mentioned by Bosker, often overlooked, and that's something we kind of you know, spend a lot of time on with clients and talk about and relates to some of the things I want to talk about today related to new technologies. Um, wasn't a, a topic that I included. Uh, wish I had after uh, the last few comments that were made because it would have been a good thing to review with everybody and share with everybody. But today, um, my intent is to talk about a couple of things, collection systems related, um, primarily focus on manholes, uh, talk about some of the different um, new technologies available on the uh, manhole side of the business, um, some of the things related to warranties, installation, um, corrosion resistance, longevity, these types of things, and give you, you know, just a little bit of my perspective as far as a compare and contrast. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, the other two items, was just talk about some of the new force main assessment technologies. Um, what's out there? What are the options? How do they compare? And again, this is only going to be about 20 minutes, so I'm not going to get real deep into any of this stuff. I just want to kind of spur some thoughts and get people thinking about some different things that are related to these items so that if you have something come up, um, you can reach out to somebody to discuss these topics further or just some things that you bring up in your discussions with the people you're working with on these items. Um, the last thing would be some a couple of different things that are out there and available for force main rehabilitation. Um, obviously, these are uh, three topics that we hold near and dear to our hearts at CPM, and we spend a lot of time on with our clients. Um, as a lot of the folks on the call probably already know, um, we're a licensed contractor. We act as a manufacturer rep, so we provide services, we provide products, we provide installations and different things related to a lot of these different items. So that's why we kind of have a pretty in-depth knowledge of what's out there, what's available. And I, I definitely want to encourage everybody as things start to open up, you know, obviously we've been doing a lot of webinars and um, uh, distance things, but as conferences become available again, you know, with with uh, AWWA and WEF and AZ Water, you know, please get out and attend these things because that's the best place to be able to try to find some of these new technologies that can really benefit your systems in the long run. And, and we try to get to as many of them as we can, um, even overseas in some cases, to try to find the latest and greatest and, and share it with everybody back in Arizona. So some of the different options that are out there, and please, if anybody has any questions, just interrupt me uh, as I go. But there's there's lots of different things out there for, for manholes, a lot of different new technologies. Some have been out there for some time now. Some have just recently been introduced. Um, there's different ways you can approach this, and all of them have you know benefits and, and advantages and disadvantages. So I just wanted to talk about kind of three of the, the primary ones that we've seen most recently out in the marketplace. Um, the first one would be the Predal PVC hybrid manholes. Um, that's something that we've been working on for some time. And what's really nice about something like this is it's all different components and pieces and materials that are already available and they're already being used in the sewer. Um, they've passed green book testing and different testing certifications for the different types of materials. And everybody's familiar with them and everybody's already using the materials that are involved in that type of construction. 
One of the other options that's out there right now is the polymer concrete. So there's several different manufacturers around the country that are uh, introducing polymer concrete. There's some that been, have been available for quite some time now, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10 years. Um, you know, that was something that was relatively a new concept at the time, um, but it's combining, you know, some, some polymer technologies with traditional concrete technologies. And then there's also fiberglass options. So the thing that's that's really key to understand, in my opinion, about the different options out there that are fiberglass uh, based is some of these fiberglass systems are fully structural. Um, there's even somebody, you know, local to the Arizona market that actually makes a fully structural fiberglass riser system. But a lot of these systems actually rely on the uh, backfill or slurry around them to provide that full structural component and they're very thin in nature. So just fully understand what, what you're looking at if you start evaluating different um, types of new materials and if they're structural or if they're not structural. Um, I just had a conversation with a, a company earlier this week and there, we were talking about a sprayed applied product, which would be more for the rehab side of manholes. And I'll talk about that just briefly here in a second. But one of the things that came up in the conversation was this product is structural. So my first question um, in relation to that was, so basically what you're telling me is that 125 mil thickness, which we all know is, is relatively thin, you could literally spray this on a cardboard sauna tube, put a concrete top on it, and submit it to H20 load testing, offset load testing that's required for a manhole to truly be structural. And I got a confused look on everybody's face when I said that. So clearly when people throw that term structural around, sometimes it has different meanings. But for us, and when it comes to a, a new construction manhole, everything related to like concrete, you know, Predal hybrid PVC manholes, polymer concrete manholes, those are all fully structural. They stand alone whether you use them for an insert on a rehab or whether you use them for a new construction standalone manhole structure. So something that's very important to keep in mind when looking at uh, manhole options. So a lot of these different new, new systems can be used for both new construction and rehab construction. So uh, typically the, the fiberglass, you know, all three of the ones I mentioned prior can all be used on new construction. Um, for a rehab type system, um, the uh, the PVC manhole system actually has a full system that goes from the invert all the way through the rim of the structure. So the bases are included in that system. Some of the other uh, insert type systems, you have to still use traditional, you know, concrete or cement and epoxy systems for the bench and the invert. Um, so it still leaves that susceptible to corrosion and sometimes it doesn't allow that rehabilitated manhole to get the same warranty that you would with their full new construction manhole. So for example, um, the, the PVC manholes give you a 55 year warranty, the Armor Rock manholes give you about a 50 year warranty, which obviously far exceeds anything else out in the marketplace. And what's really nice about those two systems, they can be competitive with even basic concrete with epoxy. So if you look at a standard concrete manhole with no protection in it whatsoever, that's going to obviously be the least expensive thing you can put in the ground, but has no warranty. Um, but these two systems can be pretty competitive against even things as simple as concrete and epoxy, which also have very limited to no warranties. Um, installed cost, you know, they, they kind of range. Um, probably the, the lowest install cost is going to be the PVC system. Then you're probably going to see the Armor Rock come in there real close to that. And then the fiberglass, just because of the material cost, is generally a little bit more expensive. But it's all going to depend on the structure, the diameter, the depths, lots of different things. So warranties, same thing. You've got different warranties for the different systems. The, the most extensive warranty in the market right now on a manhole is going to be about 55 years. Um, again, the completeness of the system, whether it goes just to, to fix the riser section in the case of a rehab, or does it go all the way down to the bench and the invert and all the way up? And then cost of ownership is obviously critical to all the utilities that are putting these in. It may be, you know, you want to look at life cycle cost and make sure you do a really good business case when comparing the different systems and looking at, you know, installation costs, material costs, corrosion resistance, 
um, operation and maintenance costs long term, and then what the replacement cost down the road is, and where that comes up on an SE curve in your asset management system, and where does that fall, and when's it going to be need to be replaced? And then obviously local impacts. You know, if you put something in a critical location, there's businesses in the area that's environmentally sensitive area. You know, you want to get something in those key critical locations that's going to last a long time and and require very little access in the future or maintenance or service in the future. So some of the different force main assessment technologies that are out there, um, there's free swimming systems, there's inline inspection tools, and then there's external inspection tools. Um, on the left here, I just dropped a picture in of an example of an external inspection tool that can be used on uh, metallic pipes. So this is an electromagnetic bracelet scanner. So this actually rolls down the pipe if you've got ductile, cast iron, steel, um, even some of the different steel cylinder pipes and can give you a full detailed inspection full circumference of every pit and defect on the pipe. Um, so that's one of the different options, but I'll go through some of the, the pros and cons of the different systems. So as far as data collection, um, inline free swimming tools are the simplest, least expensive way to get inline data. Um, the, there's different things out there and what you want to compare when you're looking at an inline free swimming tool. So for example, like a recon tool, a smart ball tool, um, Hydromax has a tool, but you really want to see what the cost is and what the data that you get out of it. So do you just get pressure data? Do you just get leak data? Do you get air pocket data? Most of the time and with that type of inspection and tool in a force main, you're trying to identify air pocket locations that you can then go back and do further inspections on. But some of the tools get a lot of a lot more data for you, like uh, pressure, temperature, debris, changes in diameter where some of them just simply report acoustics. So, you know, figure out which one's best suited for what you're trying to get, and then what's the most cost effective. Same thing with an inline inspection tool. There's lots of different companies that provide inline inspection tools. Um, there's a company we've talked to out of uh, Europe recently that has a system. There's a couple of different companies we work with here in the United States that have systems. Um, some work through companies like CPM, some provide services direct through uh, the manufacturer, but you definitely want to have local representation to try to minimize uh, and make it most efficient when you're actually out on the site doing the work. Um, but these give you a very detailed in end inspection. Now, the, the issue with a lot of these or the challenge with a lot of these um, full on inline inspection tools that are either tethered or pushed with water is that there's a lot of piping modifications that have to occur prior to launching the tools um, that runs up the cost substantially so the inspection might be a couple of hundred thousand to inspect a 5,000 foot force main but you may have about 100 to 200 to 250 thousand dollars of piping modifications and construction that has to be completed in order to properly launch and retrieve that tool and get the data do the report and make the recommendations so there's definitely some differences in overall costs um, and then the other option, of course, is the uh, external tool, like a bracelet inspection tool. So there's tools out there now that can do metallic pipes. Um, we're really excited about the introduction of some tools that can do asbestos cement pipes. There's a lot of asbestos cement water mains and force mains um, in the southwest and in Texas. And that's going to be something that really makes a big difference because, again, you're able to externally scan the pipe. You don't have to take the pipe out of service. You don't have to disassemble the pipe. You don't have to do a destructive sample to get that density data on the AEC pipe and make a determination as to how much remaining uh, structural wall is left and what the remaining useful life might be for that pipeline. Um, in the past, there was just different things like a phenol failing test, but that all had to have a pipe sample removed, sent off to a lab. The challenge with that too, as far as these destructive tests, um, there aren't very many labs out there around the country that, that perform those testing services. Um, we actually had worked with uh, um, U of A down in Tucson a few years ago to try to develop some testing sites and locations, but it, it was just very sporadic when samples would come in and I'm not sure that they're even offering those services anymore. But there are some other places around the country that do, but if you can just simply access the pipe, um, in those critical locations that are identified through an initial uh, free swimming, like uh, a recon ball survey, then it keeps you from having to, to dewater the pipe, um, pump everything down, take the sample, make the repair, and put the pipe in service. 
So, and there's lots of different things that you're going to be able to do related to the assessments that will lead to decision making on the rehab side. But one of the things that I always, always uh, kind of warn people against, if you're talking to a company that just does assessment or just does rehabilitation, um, you're, you're probably going to get pushed in that one direction or the other, depending on what those companies offer. So if you can work with a consulting company that's that's neutral or companies that provide both those sides of the, the, the spectrum, you'll get a, a much better recommendation as far as what the cost of each component would be. And then does it make sense to do the assessment or do you just need to simply move on to the rehabilitation? Um, a good example, um, we did a project recently in the Valley um, there was a three or four phase approach that we were working with a, a partner of ours on. And once we got to the second phase of a three phase approach, we were able to get some preliminary data on pipe wall and made the decision at that point. It really doesn't make any sense to spend the additional 50 to hundred thousand dollars to do the final phase. We've got enough information to make a decision. And then the decision was made to move that money that would have been involved in additional assessment over to the rehab side options and invest that money better there. So again, I'm just kind of running through these things pretty quickly, give you guys some ideas of some things to think about and consider uh, when you're looking at these different uh, new technologies. So from the assessment side, then the next step would typically be to look at rehab, replacement, um, new construction options uh, for a force main, for example. So there, there's several different things out in the marketplace right now that can be utilized to rehabilitate force mains. The, the primary systems out there or like a pull in place or a slip lining type system or a cured in place pipe system. Um, I'm sure most people, uh, I think I saw a notification the other day from the Trenchless Technologies um, magazine that basically said that the original cured in place pipe system, I think, was celebrating maybe its 50 year anniversary. So, you know, that's been around since the 70s. It's very developed, very mature on the gravity system side which is what most people at this point have used cured in place pipe systems for. But there are new systems coming out that are available for pressurized piping systems. They have a lot of limitations, but they're, they're starting to be more and more developed. They've got better pressure capacities. They're integrating fiber, uh, fiberglass backing into the uh, lining systems. So they're making them a lot more robust, but they still have a lot of limitations as far as distances and um, access points required and these types of things. So the slip lining option is another really good option. So there's different ways you can slip line. You can, you can pull, if you've got straight runs, there's systems you can use. If you've got to go through bins and 45s, there's systems you can use. Um, on the, the truck that I show in the photo here to the left is one of the systems, which is Primus Liner. Um, it's a, a pull in place system that can basically navigate bins, do long distances, um, easy pulls has minimal pressure for operating it. So just one of the things that's out there and available. So some of the things you kind of want to look at or consider um, with the different types of options that you can find out in the market right now for uh, rehabilitation is first, I like to talk about the economic impact. Um, what I'm referring to is, you know, our business is interrupted or is traffic interrupted. You know, are there multiple pits that have to be developed in order to get this installed? Does one technology require, you know, two pits to go a mile and the other one requires 25 pits to go a mile? That's going to have a huge impact to your local communities and the um, people in the area, traffic, businesses. So all things to consider that are kind of soft cost in addition to what the actual installation for the rehab system might be. Um, again, environmental impact. So are you going through an environmentally sensitive area? Um, are you going through a wash, um, an estuary? So if you've got those sorts of things as well, the longer distances and the more you can spread out those access points, the better off you are and the less impact it's going to have to your community. You know, what's the overall installed cost? A lot of times people want to ask, the first question they want to ask about a, a material-based system is what's the material cost? So really, when you're starting to look at rehab options, the actual cost of the material isn't that relevant any more than, you know, what the cost of, you know, brand new ductile iron pipe is. If you put 500,000 feet of pipe in, it really doesn't matter what the material costs. It matters what you pay when it's finally installed. And that's the question you want to ask with the rehab system. You know, what kind of access is required? Will it pull through bins? Um, how many pits are needed? What are the maximum distances you can pull it? 
Does it go through, you know, can you only pull it in straight segments? What's my diameter reduction? So all things you want to consider that that kind of lead to what that final overall cost is. Um, again, schedules, you know, is this going to be completed in two or three days compared to uh, six months on a on a new installation? Or is it going to be completed in two or three days this system versus two or three weeks for the other system? So again, all things that kind of lead back to the economic impact, environmental impact, financial impacts, and overall impacts to the community that you guys are serving, and uh, how many phone calls you're going to get throughout the project. So the other item is warranties. That's really important. Um, you know, and I and I think warranties is an issue. We we talked to um, a, a client yesterday, and he basically, you know, warranty, warranty, warranty. Whether it's a manhole, a rehab system, that was their key consideration. We want to know what the warranty is. If you don't meet a minimum warranty, we're not even going to consider the system. And that's what I'm really trying to get most people to really focus on. There's been a lot of systems out there, not much on the rehab side so far, but a lot of different manhole systems. Um, for rehabbing manholes, protecting manholes, and how long are those systems lasting? And if they're not, if they're not lasting to your expectation, it might be time to look at some of these new technologies and new materials. And even if it's a little bit more expensive, weighing that against what your cost of ownership is currently, and starting to start moving your budgeting money around to to make up these upfront costs that are going to save you lots of money down the road when it comes to operation and maintenance. So making sure you and then making sure you fully understand the warranty that's offered. Is it against corrosion? Is it against failure? Does it just cover materials? Does it cover the, the cost of replacing those materials if something does happen? And really, you know, determining how how effective that's going to be if you run into an issue with something you've installed down the road. So again, take a look at the different, you know, systems that are out there available for manholes. Please consider some of this new technology, especially in critical large diameter interceptors, critical roadways that you really don't want to be back in and dealing with in the future. Um, assessment technologies, make sure to weigh those costs against the cost of the rehab, um, you know, and, and, and be sure to do a really good analysis and make sure that whoever you're working with brings different options to the table that you can evaluate and consider and goes through all these different costs associated with it, whether it be a manhole, a condition assessment system or some sort of rehabilitation system for your force mains. So I think that probably rolls me up past 1030, so I'll I'll leave it there, see if there's any questions and then see if. Uh, there's any more information you guys would like before we move on to the next uh, presentation. Hey, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Sorry, I heard someone say something. Anyone has questions? I know you at least have a question for me, don't you, Bosker? <laughs> nah, I, I'll bug you later. <laughs> oh, Dennis has. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, hi, Chris. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering about those prefab manholes. Do they have them uh, configured for, I know they have them for junction manholes and the benches can be sort of built on site, but do they have prefab sort of um, invert structures like for pre-designed junction structures, pre-designed uh, diversion structures and flow management structures in those? I was just wondering what's available today. Yeah, and that, that's a great question and actually something uh, we, we just went through kind of a scenario down there in Tucson with with your ex employer at Pima County. Um, a good point to make about that is, first of all, yes. So the polymer systems, the fiberglass systems, they can all be incorporated into large, very large junction structures. But more importantly is understanding or bringing somebody into the conversation early on that understands the manufacturing capabilities of the different systems. Um, just to give you an example, um, we got pulled in on some diversion structures um, down in Tucson recently. 
Um, it was kind of after the design had been put together and it was already out. And we were able to literally, based on the way we could build a couple of these structures and how we could fit them into existing forms. And, and this holds true for us. It holds true for the other manufacturers that are doing these different new technologies. But how we could build these, how we could um, stage them on the job site, the, the weight and the size of some of these different things, what could be poured in the field versus what needed to be precast. We, we were able to reduce the overall cost of what they were trying to do compared to their original details by almost a half a million dollars. And that's substantial, but we weren't involved in the conversation until the thing was out on the street to a couple of different bidding contractors. So I just wanna encourage everybody, especially if you're not familiar with exactly how a lot of this stuff's built and what the standard sizing is on these things, you know, reach out to you know guys like us or, or you know different people you know at different cities, um, different manufacturers, and just ask on the front end, you know, what, what's the best way to build this? What's the best way to ship it? What's the best way to install it? Because a lot of times just some simple questions like that up front can literally save you 20, 30, 40 percent. And again, it doesn't come down to the material cost. It comes down to how you manufacture it, how you build it, how it's installed, how it's staged all those sorts of things that I think a lot of times are left out of the conversation. So re really good question, but the answer, simple answer is yes. Well, Chris, so uh, what, uh, just to add on and compliment what you've just said, um, the cost, I think the great cost is in flow management. Flow management is super expensive. And if you're waiting for a week for something to cure, um, you know, that's where the cost is in the construction. So having these things that can be basically kind of placed is, you know, clearly a huge cost uh, driver. From yeah, standards, there's, a, right? the, there's another project, Dennis, that's actually out on the street right now in, in southern Arizona. And the way it was put out originally was with riser sections that were made out of new new components, but then these diversion structure bases that were basically field poured and then coated. Um, uh, it was really interesting that the numbers that ended up coming together on this, we were able to basically precast those bases for about 10% more. We were able to put precast bases together on this particular project for about 10% more than what it was going to cost just to epoxy coat the field cast large diameter bases the way it was drawn up. So uh, again, you know, there, there's huge savings that can be involved. And like Dennis said, the delivery. You know, that a precast system, if you can do it and it's less expensive, you drop it in, you connect the pipes on either side and you backfill it and you're ready to go. You don't have to wait for the concrete to cure. You don't have to wait for the epoxies for in this example to be put on. Um, so there, there's some really big cost savings to be had. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you're doing a manhole replacement for existing manhole, um, flow management will kill you. I mean, the, the cost of, of diverting flows around that structure is, is what I'm talking about, yeah. Well, that's, again, that's, and, and, that's and, great. and taking that into consideration on the front end, when you're looking at cost of ownership, you know, yeah, you might look at it and go, okay, the, this, this man, these 20 manholes to get put in originally cost a half a million dollars. But to rehab those same 20 manholes, you, you, you could spend a half a million just on the flow management or the bypass, plus the systems to rehab them without fully ripping them out could be a half a million dollars. So you could spend twice as much on the back end to do what you did on the front end. So making sure those considerations are thought about when you're designing and selecting materials and what the warranties are and how long they'll last, right? Yeah, uh, it's huge stuff, huge, huge impact on budgets. It's important stuff, Chris. And and on the city side, they need to understand they need to budget properly. What they do is material side, and um, often Dennis, like you pointed, that the bypass bypassing costs are always forgotten, and then now it's usually put on like a bind, saying, "Okay, the budget's only this much, so how do we do it?" So, anyways, that's good discussion, guys. Uh, we got we're, we got 20 more minutes. Um, we got the last presentation. Um, Wern. Um, all right, we got Wern as well. Good deals. <laughs> I think you're uh, you're muted, sir. How about now? 
Perfect. All right. Go All ahead. Right. OK, so my presentation, actually, uh, I'm glad Dennis went in front of me because he had a, a ton of information that I am just going to gloss over because I'm not a chemist. Uh, but uh, he really dug deep into a, a lot of stuff that I'll be covering because I'll be talking about odor control as well. Um, but I'm, I'm coming from a uh, system operator standpoint. So just a little bit about myself. My name is Vernon Vasquez, uh, formerly with the city of Phoenix. Um, 1987, I was very fortunate to start my career in the wastewater collection division for the city of Phoenix. And uh, I progressed until when I finished my career, I was the deputy water services director for the city of Phoenix. So in that period of time, those 32 years, uh, a lot of mistakes made, a lot of successes, a lot of growth and learning. And one of the key things that, we, that I uh, found out uh, was about odor control in our systems. Um, odor control may not necessarily be the top priority for some systems. Um, uh, we're mostly wanting to convey our sewer water and make sure that we don't we, we do it uninterrupted and get it from the homes and businesses to the treatment plants. Um, but I found out that odor corrosion control, because they go together, uh, is actually very important uh, into the system. So with that, we'll start. And uh, I'm very simplistic in, in my uh, uh, presentation. I do a lot of pictures, so I'll be doing a lot of talking, but I hope to uh, uh, show that, well, what causes odors in a collection system? Um, why is odor corrosion control important? Um, who cares? Where is it coming from? Well, as an operator, what can I do? And then oh, how do I do it? So jumping in, this seems to be the standard model. I know when, uh, uh, odor control, and I was first introduced to odor controls about the early to mid 90s. Um, chemical additions to sewer systems was becoming in vogue. Um, and uh, that was our first uh, step into it with the city of Phoenix. And so, well, what causes it? Essentially what this graph is saying is that um, this is a transition from uh, uh, sulfur compounds and becoming uh, sulfur and how they mix with the water come in hydrogen sulfide and how it off gases and then you have hydrogen sulfide gas. Uh, the way it was explained to me early on is that well the bacteria in in the sewer water uh, starts off as aerobic. Uh, what happens is it uses all the oxygen high BOD in this water so now you got uh, uh, anaerobic conditions and that's where the sulfur is generated and you and you start having odors. So who cares? Well, your uh, um, your customers are going to care. So your 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 city council is going to care uh, because when the phones start ringing, uh, customers are saying, "Hey, this sewer stinks. You need to do something about this." Nobody cares what you do, how you do it. Just make sure it gets done. So also, more reasons to care is that there's we're regulated. Regulated. So this is the uh, Air Administra Arizona Administrative Code. And what it talks about is uh, Maricopa County in our area, uh, pollution control regulations, they tell you that uh, no person shall emit hydrogen sulfide from any location in such a manner or amount um, that the concentration of such emissions into the ambient air at any occupied uh, place beyond the premises, which is the source of located exceeds 0 0.3 parts per million uh, by volume of an average period of 30 minutes more. So. That basically says that's a really low threshold. And so um, a lot of times what happens is that we can have high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide in, in our collection system, in our manholes where it starts off gassing. Um, as soon as it hits the atmosphere, it does tend to dilute rather quickly. Um, so, but there are areas where it's a captured uh, environment and uh, the, this, uh, this rule might come into play very quickly. So why is it important? So here's an example of why it's important. So this is the same manhole, and this actually ties into what Chris was talking about. So this is the same manhole. This is a salt, very, very sulfided. Uh, it was a uh, unprotected uh, or cast manhole, cast concrete. And so this is after it was rehabilitated. And, you know, but the costs associated with that are, yeah, they're high. It, it, it costs a lot. Um, this is the cheapest route of rehabilitating this manhole rather than 
uh, digging up the entire manhole and replacing it. We apparently had enough structure in the manhole and then with the added structure strength of, of the uh, rehabilitation process, we we're able to save this manhole. Sometimes you can't, but this is the uh, the corrosion portion of uh, odor and corrosion control. Here's another reason why. So this was a uh, force main that failed and uh, because the top of the pipe had become corroded uh, due to gas uh, building up in there and eventually it ate away and this is what it ended up at. So another very dramatic reason on why we have to have corrosion uh, odor corrosion control in our systems. So who are the known bad actors uh, in this situation? Well, municipal and private lift stations are obviously going to be one because you have um, the retention that's in the wet well uh, is going to allow those ba that bacteria to feed and, and to create an uh, uh, anoxic uh, condition. Large transition transmission mains, very slow moving, heavy flows. They're also um, one of the main contributors, your usual suspects. And then uh, commercial discharge, because we really never really know exactly who's upstream um, and what they're discharging into your system. So traditional odor control for us, so the top left picture is simply you seal the manhole. Seal it, you keep it contained um, if you can, and then there's no there's no odors outside. And so it's kind of like, you know, out of sight, out of mind. On the right is a, um, uh, that's an odor scrubber. It's a, it's a pretty much older technology now, but it's, it's effective. So that's an odor scrubber uh, at one of our, our list stations. And then on the bottom, is a biofilter. So that was uh, not so new technology, but uh, it's becoming more in vogue. And I, I'm a great proponent of uh, biofiltration. It, it takes, there's no chemicals involved. You you have, a, a, it's very green technology. Uh, it's very effective. And uh, within the city of Phoenix, we were starting to uh, replace all of our uh, um, scrubbers with, with these uh, biofilters. So now, now we're, that was the air phase uh, treatment. So now we're getting to uh, chemical treatment. There's a couple sites that we have uh, with the city of Phoenix. So the left is, uh, is a calcium nitrate bioxide, uh, is a trade name, but calcium nitrate, calcium salt. And so what it does is that when it enters into the sewer system, um, it gives that bacteria uh, an oxidative food source. So it attracts them and reduces your, your uh, loading of H2S or of uh, sulfide uh, in liquid phase. So if you're reducing your, your liquid phase, then obviously you're going to reduce the off-gassing into the atmosphere. So there are lots of chemicals. I'm not going to uh, touch on, on uh, many of them. Uh, as as uh, Dennis had, had mentioned that he kind of went through that list. There's a lot of different ones. They all have pluses. They all have minuses. It, it really depends on budget. It depends on your system, because remember, whatever you're going to put into your collection system, it's going to end up at your treatment plant. So you really need to partner with your, your uh, uh, treatment plant personnel so that you guys can uh, come up with a good balance. So um, the other one to the right is uh, ferrous chloride. So it's it's an iron salt. Um, so typically what that's going to do for you is that that's going to bind your, your uh, sulfides and it keeps them in solution. So you're going to have really heavy sulfided water, but it's not going to off gas. It's not going to uh, get into the atmosphere. So you essentially kind of get the same um, uh, result, but honestly kind of completely different uh, paths to get there. So who are the sneaky bad actors? Well, restaurant grease interceptors. Uh, are, are some. So um, what I found out through my experience in the city of Phoenix is that whenever you have a collection of restaurants all in one area and they're discharging into the same um, small diameter collection system, what you're going to have, if, if you have five or more restaurants, um, we found is that about a mile and a half, two miles down downstream, you're going to have odors. And it's in a small collection system and you may not you may ask yourself why do i have odors in a small collection system you know i clean the heck out of this it's 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 really clean but i have uh high concentrations of, of hydrogen sulfide well if you look upstream more than likely what you're going to find is is a lot of restaurants 
um, discharging through that process all at the same time. Typically between say 11 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, they're gonna overwhelm your system with their discharge. So in the perfect world, just, just an illustration of a typical grease interceptor, you got your oils and greases float up, solids to the bottom, your fresh water um, goes out and everything is great. Well, this is real world. So this is what when uh, our environmental service division inspectors, commercial inspectors would go, you know, they took this picture for me and they said, this is a lot of restaurants may or may not follow the recommended cleaning procedures. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of BOD going on in there. So exponential real world. So this is this happened to us. And what you got there is every one of those red flags is a restaurant. So, and this is at the beginning of the sewer system. So uh, you're at the top end of the sewer system. All of those restaurants, they actually usually, when I said usually a couple miles down the road, it's because there's a dilution factor of when these restaurants hit, a little bit of a dilution, but downstream, they're gonna overwhelm the system and you will have H2S. This one didn't make it out of the parking lot because there was so much um, sulfide going into the system that um, it overwhelmed it and we had odor complaints. So in this scenario, and, and uh, as Dennis said also, consideration is if you're gonna have one of those sites, where are you gonna put it? You have to be very strategic on where you're gonna put it. Some, some uh, chemicals take a while before they have an effect. Some of them are instantaneous. So again, it depends on, on the situation that you're in, on which uh, solution that you decide upon. Well, this one, we didn't have a footprint. We don't own any of this property. Uh, we have a right away, of course, but we really don't have any property in there to put an odor control uh, uh, site, feed site. So what we ended up thinking about is that it, it just worked out this way. Our water distribution system had a dead end water line up here and they were having to flush it all the time to keep the water fresh. And so what we did is that we turned and put an auto flusher into one of our manholes at the top of the system and we created that uh, dilution effect and that worked for us. So my point being here is that it doesn't always have to be a chemical. So um, think outside the box and look at what your resources are and but um, you know water diluting the, diluting the sewer system worked perfect in this in this situation. So, and it also worked out for the water distribution system because they were having to flush that system periodically anyway because of uh, uh, the dead end system on that water. So, other uh, sneaky bad actors are lift stations. So, whether it's a uh, a city owned lift station or sometimes private lift stations, you know, in uh, my experience, we've had uh, we had a really bad odor odorous uh, area, and what happens? You had three separate um, private lift stations all uh, discharging into one manhole and they were there was super hydrogen sulfide gas going through there and and really what they did is they created so much odor for neighbors downstream um, that it was coming out through their vent pipes I mean we could seal the system but it was coming out through their vent pipes so created another challenge on how do we uh, treat that as a, as a municipal owner we're not creating the, uh, uh, or contributing to the sulfides in the system it's private entities that are doing it um, in that case, we actually also put uh, uh, a water flush uh, device in that manhole and dilution helped with that as well. So in the lift stations, so here you go, you got a brand new lift station, everything's nice, it's maintained, it's cleaned. And then this is what happens when, you know, I mean, they're cute when they're puppies, but when they grow up, this is what you end up with. So it's important to maintain our lift stations. Uh, making sure that we're washing our wet wells, we're, we're removing the, the solids, the grease, and uh, keeping them clean. So that goes a long way to help. Um, uh, somebody mentioned earlier about odors traveling through a lift station um, at, and then when it's into the, uh, the, um, the force main, and then you have odors at, at the uh, um, relief valves. Um, one of our ways of, of dealing with that is that we treated the sewer going through the force main um, and we were able to, to treat that because at the discharge end, you can have uh, high sulfide or hydrogen sulfide coming out. And so if we're treating it through the lift station, uh, that helped out a lot as well. So industrial discharge. So um, those are, that's a really probably the sneakiest of the bad actors is that uh, you got somebody or a business that's discharging and there's, 
It depends on the type of business, whether there's some regulatory um, uh, ways of managing it and say going after them and making them responsible. Um, there, sometimes you're on your own. There's not a lot of help. I've, I've had a, a, an example of, of uh, a business that that ran these these porta johns. So all these porta johns, big event is uh, well that waste has got to go somewhere. So what they're doing is they're going to pack pack these up and, and pump these out and take the, their, their tankers. And if they're not discharging directly at the treatment plant, then they may take it back to their business. They'll discharge it there and then it goes into the system and it's going to overwhelm your system, say as like a, a, a restaurants, a accumulation of restaurants or wet wells. So um, this was another real world experience on how, what are contributors to these odors into our system. So be the hero. Know your system. Nobody knows your system better than you do. First thing you're going to do is you want to clean, you want to inspect, and you want to make sure that you have a, a really good methodical uh, maintenance program so that you know what your system's doing. Uh, cleaning, television inspection, we should be doing that to our systems all the time because it's a dynamic system, things change, and you want to be have your finger on the pulse of your system and uh, know what's going on. So, Identify your problem areas. So this was a 39th Avenue interceptor, city of Phoenix, and we had odors down that system. Um, some of it had to do with flow characteristics and the hydraulics of, of the pipe. That's important, um, but you still have to treat it. So when uh, you're looking at these, you have to identify, well, what are the hotspots? What can I do? Set your goals. So um, when you're when you're you're uh, treating your system or you're potentially going to treat your system, well, what are you going to treat it to? Um, so in order to know that, first of all, you have to know what the system is doing for you. So these are just um, pretty much basic tools of the trade. Uh, our service personnel are trained to use these, go out and use them. They're not super complicated to use. The liquid sampling, that's a, that's a Lamont uh, sampling kit. And it'll give you a snapshot of what your sewer looks like and, and what the sulfides in solution are. Uh, all of my staff was trained to use it. It's super easy. Um, the other side of that, and, and we use actually use these a lot in combination when we're we, when we know our hot spots and we're taking um, sampling. We're going to do a liquid sample and then we'll hang a, a odor logger in that manhole for up to a week at a time and gather all that data and then take a look at the two of them together to see what we got. Gives you a great picture of what your system is doing. So liquid sampling, this is a very simple uh, Excel spreadsheet that we created and you're capturing all this data. So as the field staff is, is uh, uh, taking, that's a Lamont uh, test kit at the top, that picture there. So you, you just, you, you, you take these samples. Now this one, we're treating with nitrates, so we want to know what the nitrates are. We want to know what our sulfides milligram per liter in, in solution. Um, that was our feed rate for that, that pumping system or that, uh, tr uh, that tr uh, treatment site. And then, so your temperature, your pH, again, also very important uh, variables to know where you're at in the sewer. And then uh, add comments and then who was sampled by and why. So these, these records, once you capture them, you know, you have them forever. Um, there were many times when I would go back to see what this snapshot in time is, but I would go back to previous months, previous even a year before or, or other years to compare them to see are things changing? If something's changed, well, why has it changed? Is there some different uh, contributing factor into the system? If I'm starting to get more odors or sulfide in the system, maybe there's a new tenant or something upstream. So, um, Really simple record keeping can be extremely valuable. Um, so again, I think this is the same thing. Yeah, so this is essentially the same thing. It's just a bigger picture of it. Um, but again, it's just a really simple uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet to keep to maintain. So there you are, there's your, your OTA loggers. So there's a week uh, of, of data going on. You can see, I don't know if you can see it necessarily in this picture, but it peaks at near 500 uh, ppm. And so that's really super high. Uh, the average on this one's probably up closer to 200, 180 something. I think I really can't see it there. But the next slide or the picture underneath it is that when we started treating with iron, in this case, it was it was a large 
uh, interceptor. When we started treating with iron, you can see when the iron took effect, boom, it dropped it all the way down to almost undetectable. So uh, again, uh, de depending on which chemical you decide to use or which process you're going to use, these are the kind of effects that you can see in your system. Uh, OK, so there it is. That's the, that's just a, a bigger picture of what was illustrated on the previous slide. But this is where the iron introduction hit and you can see it just dropped down to, to, to zeros and we were able to maintain that. Uh, more data again, I'm going to fly through this because I know we're, we're pretty much out of time. But again, it's just the the uh, 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 examples of our of two different sites for for. Uh, oh, this is the atmospheric data. Yeah, so this is our taking that data from that that Oda logger and then putting it into uh, uh, an Excel spreadsheet. So be the hero, happy customers. Um, and you know what, when your city council is going to, they're not going to know that they're, they're going to thank you, but they will appreciate it when they don't get those those angry phone calls. So that's it. That's I, I know if I kind of flew through that. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to attempt to answer them. Right on right time, time. o'clock. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vern. Any questions for Vern? All right, I'll 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 have I I'll ask one question. Vern, when you said liquid sampling, um, what type of sampling equipment you you've used? Uh, um, in in addition to your order logs, so the liquid sampling is is uh, dropping a, a a vessel into the the, the sewer flow, uh -huh. uh, fishing it out, and then and then using the Lamont uh, test kits, which you um, adding chemicals to. You have two vials of the sewer, and you're you're adding uh, different chemicals to them, and and what happens is one of them is is. Uh, um, going to be an example vial and the other one depending on the amount of sulfide it's going to turn blue and okay. so so what you'll do is then you add a dye to the other vial to match the uh, uh the first dial the one that's turned blue that's sulfided you'll you'll add dye to the second vial and then you'll match the colors and then it will tell you depending on how many drops of dye uh you've you've added to it to give you a pretty good picture on on the amount of sulfide uh, that's in solution that's in solution, not in the vapor phase, but in solution because typically the the H two S in solution phase will end up into the vapor phase, or and it that's going to cause that. Okay, right. No, so good. that's we'll use uh, both methods uh, simultaneously a lot of times. So um, when when we were treating with the calcium nitrate, um, we we know we don't we've we've uh, pretty much taken the vapor phase out of it because it's the 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 liquids the liquid uh, uh, data is going to be more important to me uh, because I've reduced the amount of sulfide in the sewer itself in the in the water. Um, so in doing that, I have uh, uh, if I have too low uh, of a uh, sulfide, and, and so the goal is if I in liquid phase, I'm keeping it around. Um, what am I doing? I am one milligram per liter is typically what I'm wanting in liquid phase. So if I'm exceeding that by a bunch, well, then there's something wrong in my feed system. Uh, maybe there was a power outage or I don't, I'm not sure, ran out of chemical, who knows, but maybe got to look at that if, if we know that we're already treating it. But if it's it's really low and, and I'm getting zeros in there and no sulfites, then more like I'm over treating. So there's there's that's kind of how you gauge the feed rate is by taking these samples. Now the 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 atmosphere air phase uh, uh, data that we're collecting is because like with iron you're going to have super high concentrations of, of sulfide in your in your in solution, but that's okay. It's it's but it's trapped there. It's it's, it's uh, the iron has precipitated it and, and and bound it in place. So now it's not getting into the headspace or getting out of out of the solution. Um, but with that atmospheric data, another range would be ours was, I think, uh, 40 parts per million is, is what we were looking at. 40 to 100 parts per million uh, was, was fine because you're not going to get any odor complaints. You're not going to see uh, corrosion in your system with that low of a concentration of, uh, uh, of hydrogen sulfide. Now, I know that exceeds what Maricopa County would have, but again, 
You're not going to get corrosion in your system. And then when you're at between 40 and 100 parts per million, when it escapes your manholes, it's going to get into the air. It's going to it's going to disperse really quickly. So you're not going to get your odor complaints and you're protecting your system in that range. That's that was our uh, findings. Thank you, Vern. De Dennis, you have a, a last question. We are four minutes out, but. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, I think some interest. Vern, great presentation. Uh, uh, to uh, my uh, picture. Uh, pictures in mind but i was going to ask uh, phoenix is kind of one of the more unique or at least ahead of the a lot of places in the extreme use of uh scalping plants in the surrounding communities and that your guys sewer I, I, i'm sorry Dennis. How I, did didn't catch, I didn't catch part of your you broke up i'm sorry to catch that okay um the phoenix has um, a lot of the solids from the surrounding community treatment plant, scalping plants, meaning they take out reclaimed water and they, you know, they treat the water, but they dump the solids back into the um, Phoenix sewers. How did you guys deal with the high solids content in your flow? So, yeah, so there's there's one community that shall rename, remain nameless that, that we, we are aware of that does something like that for us and we thank them. Um, so a lot of the solids, um, those are into our, our, uh, trans or the transmission mains or the, the, like, uh, uh, the interceptors. So what we found as far as solid removals, um, pretty much about on a 10 year cycle of taking those out and, and cleaning those as, as best we can, because, you know, they're really large pipes. You got 72 inch, 96 inch pipe. Um, that's, that's a huge project to undertake. Uh, for the solids, we are finding that we were getting solids in the system. So, but those those uh, other cities that are that are contributing flows, it's it's multi-owned. It, it may flow through the city of Phoenix proper, but it's not owned by the city of Phoenix. We'll maintain what's within our system, but the cost of maintaining or rehabilitating that's shared with all the other sister cities that are uh, contributing, and the costs are are all uh, shared in that as well. Um, so, for the solids. It's it's uh you know we'll we'll go in and, and take samples to see if we can figure out some sometimes we'll do some ultrasonic ultrasonic uh, 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 um, collection of it to see if what the bottom of the pipe looks like. Um, we found that it takes we can go probably about every ten years and we'll we'll do a uh, a thorough cleaning of the system. Uh, for the odors, we found out that uh, uh, there's one particular chemical is it was uh, ferrous chloride iron works really well for us on those long uh, pipes and big big uh, sewer pipes that are flowing. Um, we've had really good success with using iron and then you can uh, actually scrub out the iron downstream a ways and you can make it re-effective and we use hydrogen peroxide for that process. That's that's a, 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 a proprietary system, um, but it works, it's effective. Sounds good, Vern. Uh, that is good. Uh, thank you all. Once again, thanks for our sponsors for supporting this webinar. Uh, as AZ Water Collections Committee, we'll be we'll be setting up these webinars periodically. Uh, keep your eyes peeled, and uh, uh, the the any of the members or any of the um, audience that are not part of the Collections Committee, um, I sincerely request you to join. Uh, the collections committee. We have a monthly a monthly meeting, and uh, we'd like you to uh, join and contribute, and you know, share your knowledge. Um, anything, uh, anything else? Am I missing, Shanna? I think we're good. Uh, thank you all. We can uh, the the webinar. We can we can uh, meet next time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, the opportunity.